Hi, Facebook friends. Michelle Lipman's here with Idaho News 6. Thank you for joining us on this Tuesday morning for Making the Grade. And as always, we want to hear from your, you, your thoughts, your comments, as we discuss education in Idaho, especially in the midst of a continuing pandemic. Joining me live via his office, Kevin Richard from Idaho Education News. Hi, Kevin. How are you? Hi, Michelle. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. I have an empty house today because today my kids are doing the in-school learning. And I know so many parents are battling what happens next and we can jump right into that. If we have any Boise School District parents out there or teachers, we'd love to hear from you as the Boise School District has changed its plans yet again. Not surprising with the K-12 coronavirus case numbers that continue to be increasing. But what we do know is that the Boise School District will be going back to complete remote learning after Thanksgiving, Kevin. Mm -hmm. Is this a shock? Not really. Now, if you look at the numbers, if you look at what's been going on in Boise and in the Boise School District, it's really hard to see how the school board had any choice in the matter but to go online. We've been chronicling these numbers. Basically, Boise has logged about 200 coronavirus cases in the schools in just the past week. And that's about double what they had seen in the two weeks preceding. And, you know, it's a reflection of what we see going on statewide. And these are the statewide figures, which are also going up. As the numbers continue to rise in Boise and as the numbers continue to rise in Ada County as a whole, uh, the Boise trustees said we can't continue this and the Boise administrator said we can't sustain this we're having you know we're having trouble finding substitute teachers we're having a, a difficult time you know, just staffing the classrooms and, and keeping the schools open and the message that the administrators and the message that the school board tried to deliver last week was that it wasn't so much a flaw in their plan as it as they see it it's a flaw in you know the community's response to coronavirus and a flaw in the, you know, the community's uh, attempts to mitigate the coronavirus spread. So that's kind of where it stands with Boise schools and their hope is to return to some sort of face-to-face -face learning after the holidays, after, uh, you know, after Martin Luther King Day in mid-January. You know, we'll see. I mean, if you, if you you know, if you listen to what the health experts are saying nationally and, and locally, we're in for a couple of tough months here with the coronavirus case spread and as that translates to hospitalizations. So we'll see where we're at after the holidays. But uh, in the short term, the decision the school board made on Thursday, not really a surprise at all. I want to get back to what you said there. And we were looking at a photo there of Superintendent Kobe Dennis. And Superintendent Dennis said, literally, they cannot sustain operations with so many people who are ill. And we're not just talking about students who are ill, but their staff and how they run the school. So Kevin, I wanted to dive in a little bit deeper as we have been talking about so often over the last six months that the decision to open or close schools, what kind of plan is done in the school districts is ultimately up to the school boards. But here you had a top administrator essentially begging the trustees to make a different decision. So is it going to be fascinating to you to watch how the different administrators work with their boards to figure out what's supposed to happen next? It will be worth watching very closely and, and watching at the district level to see what happens and also in the macro, what is happening statewide, what are the trends? I can't imagine that what Boise did last week is going to be something that happened in isolation. I've got to believe that other school districts uh, around the state, big districts, small districts, urban districts, rural districts are going to face similar decisions. Um, when you look at what's happening with the coronavirus statewide and you look at these case numbers and you see these, uh, these school case numbers, it's not isolated. It's not just an Ada County problem. It's not just a Treasure Valley problem right now. Uh, numbers are spiking all over the state. You know, I do my weekly roundup of these numbers, and I know this sounds repetitive, but I really think it's important to stress here. We're seeing record new cases around the state, and we saw another record last week. And what I found significant was that you saw case numbers increasing by at least 10%. That's a pretty sizable increase in one week. 10% increases in 36 of Idaho's 44 counties. This is 
as close to a statewide outbreak as you could imagine. So what Boise had to do on Thursday, I think you're going to have other districts facing similar decisions and facing similar problems to what Kobe Dennis talked about in Boise. We can't staff our schools. We can't get substitutes in the classrooms. We can't keep our teachers in the classrooms if we're quarantining. Those quarantine numbers are really significant in Boise. And I can't imagine that what Boise is dealing with with quarantines is is in an is in isolation either. I think that this is, uh, unfortunately, I think this is what we're going to see unfold around the state in the weeks to come. The West Ada Board of Trustees is scheduled to meet tonight, tonight and yeah. there is nothing on their agenda that is looking specifically at making the same move that Boise is doing. That's not to say that that discussion won't happen or that they couldn't vote to do something different. But I wanted to bring up the West Ada dashboard as we talked about this. What is of note to me, and maybe not a surprise here, Kevin, but hot spots tend to be, and not just in West Ada, but across the board, it seems like, in high schools. That high school students, and maybe that's because of who they are. I don't know if you have high school parents out there who want to chime in on this but the transmission rates in high schools is definitely higher than in the middle or elementary schools. And I think there are a lot of reasons why. If you just think about the, the environment in a high school as opposed to the environment in a grade school, you've got high school students who move around from class to class. They move around through the hallways between classes. Uh, high school students have you know extracurricular activities, be it sports or you know, music or drama or, you know, clubs and activities, you know, high school students work, you know, many of them outside of school. They're, they have a lot more of a social life in high school as opposed to elementary school. So I don't think we should be surprised at all that we're seeing these uh, outbreaks in the high schools. But what I want to call attention to, as long as we've got the dashboard on the screen, you look at that case per 100,000 rate in the high schools in West Ada, right around where our arrow is, about 56, 57 cases per 100,000. That's a higher infection rate than we're seeing in Ada County as a whole. That's pretty significant. And especially when you compare it with what's going on in the middle schools and the elementary schools, infection rates you know, quite a bit lower than what we're seeing in the community at large. So these high school numbers, not just in West Ada, I saw them in several of the Boise high schools in the past week. We're seeing them in high schools around the state. Really not a surprise that the problem area right now in K-12 is, is the high schools. And, you know, just think about the high school environment versus the grade school or the middle school environment. And I think it's pretty clear why you're having more of a problem in the high schools. We're getting some comments in, Kevin. I want to bring our listeners and viewers in Bernadette saying West Ada trustees didn't and continue to not listen to administrators and teachers at all. Very sad. I don't know, Bernadette, where you're coming from on that. Um, and then Afton is joining us saying that we should have remained remote learning rather than returning to campuses at the onset of colder months. That's why things have gotten worse. So just a couple of comments from people coming in there. And then again, Kelly's talking to us, asking us, you know, what's happening in the Nampa School District and what is happening in the Pocatello School District. This is going back to our discussion there, Kevin, with what will happen statewide. And I think all of this is just a big mix of people not able to be able to say exactly what is going to happen in the future, except you look at the numbers now and the trends are not good. Right. I don't have any current information on Pocatello. I did look at Nampa's school district dashboard in terms of case numbers. It's not as, they don't have as many new cases or active cases in Nampa as opposed to West Ada and Boise. But you look what's happening in Canyon County at large and you see the case numbers and the increases in case numbers in Canyon County. You know, it, it's hard to imagine that that's not gonna have an impact at some point. So we're, we're gonna be watching Nampa, we're gonna be watching the uh, districts in, in Canyon County and we'll keep an eye out on West Ada's meeting tonight to see what comes up, if anything. 
we're bringing up the health and welfare document here and all these documents that we're showing, again, I will say this over and over again, these are public documents. So any of you can look exactly at what, this is what the state's reporting and it's broken down school by school, week by week with how many cases are reported in each school in particular. It's pretty fascinating and you can get a real sense of what's happening. Many of the school districts have, we have shown you with like West Ada have decided to do dashboard measurements and if you want to find any of these links, you can either go to our website, you can go to idahoednews.org. Kevin does a fantastic job of linking to all of these dashboards with inside of his stories. One of the stories, Sammy Edge, a reporter at Idaho Ed News, posted yesterday, Kevin, it broke my heart. So she was talking with folks who are literally going door knocking to try and find lost, missing, no-show students. Tell us just briefly what this pandemic has cost districts in terms of trying to figure out where some students have gone and they can't find them. First of all, shout out to my coworker, Sammy Edge, who did a fabulous job with this story. It's an amazing piece of journalism and I will not be able to do it justice just talking about it in a minute or so. Go to idahoednews.org and read her story. It's, it's terrific. What she looked at was the number of students who school districts just don't know where they are. They were supposed to show up in the fall. They didn't show up in the fall. And, you know, school districts and school administrators are trying to figure out exactly what became of these kids. Are they at work? Are they homeschooling? Or, or has something more serious happened in their households? And, and she tells the story through the staff at West Middle School in Nampa, knocking on doors, trying to find out what's happening with kids tracking down some kids and then wondering, well, we've, we've tracked them down. We know what their whereabouts are today. The real test will come in the days uh, days ahead to see if they show up in, in school. But here's the bottom line number. And as we're scrolling to it, I'll, I'll, I'll get to 11,000 students, more than 11,000 students who were expected to show up this fall. They never did. And, and that's, that's a hard number to get at. And we had to do a little bit of, uh, you know, massaging with the numbers to get there. But it's, it's a it's a good reflection of the situation, and it's far above what we've seen in past years in terms of no-show students. Part of the problem here, part of the challenge of trying to quantify the problem is Idaho has very lax laws in terms of homeschooling and in terms of reporting if you're homeschooling a, a child. You know, we give parents a lot of latitude in homeschooling and, and a lot of autonomy to make their decisions regarding homeschooling their kids. And, you know, that occurs with very little oversight. So part of the problem, and it's not a new problem, this is just how the law has been for years, is in the reporting on homeschool students. So, you know, the, the pandemic has brought that into sharper focus. Do you see a change in the way data is recorded with inside the education department coming out of the pandemic. I mean, you kind of make a point there, Kevin, with knowing that there are over 11,000 plus students who are no-shows at schools. And there's no reason why many of those may not be homeschooled, but do there need to be better metrics? Are there, are there holes, are there gaps, are there loopholes perhaps even in the way we as a state count students and for that matter know where they are that's a tough call and it will be a tough political decision if it comes before the legislature you know this goes back a long time where the state has been very very clear and very strong in the idea that parents who decide to homeschool their, their children should have you know very, you know, should have autonomy, should be able to make that decision with little interference and little reporting requirements uh, with the state. So that's where we've been, and that's where we've been for for years. And, you know, as I say, and as Sammy reported in, in her piece, we have some of the most lenient laws in the nation regarding homeschools, homeschooling students and reporting on homeschooling students. So does that change in response to what we've seen during this pandemic, I don't know. I think that there are probably school administrators and school officials who would say, you know, it would be it'd be good to know. It would be good to have better data and be able to track these kids, you know, not to, you know, be checking up on the parents or anything like that, just to be able to say, 
we know where these kids are and we, we can account for what's happening in those, those kids' lives and what's happening with those kids' education. Just, you know, just has some sort of a, a, some baseline data to know where these kids are. But that runs up against uh, parental rights and it runs up against a legislature that's been very strong and very steadfast in the idea of protecting parental rights uh, with regard to homeschooling. Tough political issue. Jan is joining us. This is her comment here. 11,600 students not showing up and they are entertaining full remote learning. If you're talking about Boise School District there. What a disaster. That is a scary number. And however you feel about remote learning and what's happening with the pandemic, it is a scary number. There's no doubt about it. And I think when we sit here and talk, Kevin, about the mental health of students and students needing to be in school just for their mental health, there's also an aspect here that schools provide physical health, whether that just be food for some students who need it or an accountability that those students are physically okay in their homes. And you get a number like 11,000 plus students who have been no-shows, there's got to be better accounting somehow, some way, and yet you balance that against parental rights. And we know, at least anecdotally, we know, and, and you know, we know that some of those 11,600 kids are special needs students. They're, they're more at risk students. Um, Sammy talked to uh, Harold Neville, who's the administrator with CASA. That's the uh, Kenyan Owyhee uh, school consortium that does provide some some special education and some some services for, for at risk students. And he, he talked about at least one student that he knows of who has some, some some special needs and doesn't really know where that student is right now and doesn't really know what's happening. So that's just one anecdotal uh, piece of the story. But we, we know that if we're talking about 11,600 students, that's a large number of kids. Uh, there have to be some kids there who have some some special challenges some special educational challenges that aren't being met. We're going back to the high school conversation here with Shelly, and she's saying high school should go fully online. They can stay home alone, work on a laptop better than middle or grade school kids can. And again, it will be fascinating to see whether or not schools, as we get further, if the numbers continue to increase, if they continue to trend the way they have been, if school districts, Kevin, take a school by school approach, even possibly a classroom by classroom approach, or if they do maybe what Shelly's talking about and, and send the high schoolers home, like in West Ada where the numbers are skyrocketing in the high schools. And that's kind of where Boise and West Ada started this school year, if, if you remember. Uh, both districts tried to start by getting the youngest students in the classrooms first. For you know, for all of those reasons that, that, that the commenter is bringing up, but also, you know, understanding that the risk of spread in the grade school doesn't seem to be as you know, as widespread as we're seeing in the high school. So for health reasons and for educational reasons, the districts did try to start there with, with the youngest students first. And some districts have given their superintendents permission, the, the boards have given their superintendents permission to actually make those calls without the board being involved, which again, harkens back to our conversation at the beginning of making the grade today, which is that how are districts working together to make these really difficult calls? Yeah, yeah, and in Boise's case, uh, the board gave the administration wide latitude to figure out a, a reopening plan and to execute the reopening plan. We can't be remiss if we don't talk about our higher ed students and what's happening with campus coronavirus cases. Kevin and the team at Idaho Ed News do a terrific job of tracking these numbers as well because there are plenty of folks out there who know that, talk about students who have the ability to make their own decisions. And specifically, Kevin, we've seen a rapid increase in certain colleges and universities. Let's start in with focusing on Northwest Nazarene University, who as of even today is still under a stay in place order. What happened? Well, cases went up pretty sharply at NNU. And in response to that, and in anticipation that things could get even worse, NNU issued this uh, stay in place order last Tuesday. Last Tuesday evening, the, the news came out and it went into effect on Wednesday. It stays in effect through today. And the hope is, uh, last I heard, the hope is that NNU can resume 
face-to-face learning on Wednesday, do a few days of face-to-face learning before the Thanksgiving break. Um, first school in the state to have to go to a stay in place or an online learning model, even just for a short period of time. Uh, you know, almost every college and university in the state saw an increase in case numbers over the past week or so. And, and, and you saw, I think their cases doubled over the course of last week as opposed to the previous week. Um, you know, and, and you know, a college environment is a difficult environment to, uh, you know, to prevent a spread because you've got students living in dorms, living in close quarters. Again, students in classes together, moving around the campus, uh, maybe have extra, you know, extracurricular activities or or, or jobs that they have outside of the, uh, you know, outside of the school day. I mean, there are a lot of ways for uh, the coronavirus to spread within a college campus. So. The kind of increase that we saw at NNU, and we've seen uh, some increases at almost every other college in the state, really not surprising. And, and I think NNU and Boise State and U of I and Idaho State are really just trying to get to Thanksgiving at this point. We've talked about that throughout the semester, that Thanksgiving is kind of a break point. Uh, schools are going to go to online learning or optional online learning after the Thanksgiving break because their concern is students are going to come back from Thanksgiving and may be at risk of uh, uh, bringing the coronavirus back to the campus with them. So we're about a week to the Thanksgiving break, so we'll see how the next few days play out. That's going to be a critical measurement, I think, too, for health officials and school administrators, of course, but to see what happens with coronavirus when students leave their college campuses and come back home wherever their home is and what happens with the numbers then and then if the spread can be controlled by not sending them back to school after that thanksgiving week it, it, it's, it's, again, health, it's it's all a big experiment isn't it? it it is an experiment it's a health issue it's also an enrollment issue and we talked about the enrollment figures and I, i've been writing about the enrollment numbers or a piece last week about how idaho students seem to be coming to colleges and university campuses in lower numbers than we've seen in the past. You know, recent high school graduates going straight to college, those numbers seem to be decreasing across the board. That's an, enroll, an enrollment challenge driven partly by this pandemic, partly by the economic upheaval resulting from the pandemic. You know, we're seeing an immediate effect on campuses in terms of fall enrollment. Spring enrollment is going to be a big deal. We're going to really want to watch closely to see how many students come back in the spring, how many feel safe, how many feel like they're getting the, the the kind of learning and the kind of educational environment that they want to pay for? You know, are they getting the face-to-face -face learning and the, the quality of instruction that they that they want, that they demand and deserve? So spring enrollment is going to be a big deal and it's going to be something we watch very closely. Not knowing exactly where we're going to be in this pandemic in January, but uh, based on what we're hearing from the experts, we're going to be in a tough place in January. You know, it, it just looks it looks like we're heading into a rough few months here as we uh, as schools try to reopen in the spring, both K-12 and higher education. And you know, we as a state and a nation uh, navigate through uh, a tough wave uh, of the, the pandemic. We always love here on Making the Grade to hear your thoughts and your comments about what's happening, uh, even in your own situation, your own home. And, and Afton's got an interesting point saying that they worked up an arrangement with our daughter and a few of her closest friends to do online learning together. So one week at one student's home and then they rotate so that they can have those social interactions during breaks, talk through areas where they're struggling together. Now, Afton saying here, they're keeping distance, they're mm -hmm. wearing masks, but they're together and it's been working really well. So the other thing that's fascinating to me, Kevin, and this is gonna be what you and I talk about hopefully a year from now when we're, we're past the crisis mode of where learning is, is what works for one student may not work for another, but at the same time, there may be different learning opportunities that will come out of this pandemic that we could have never realized because we were stuck in such a traditional education space. So it's just things like that that I love hearing from parents to see that it's working for them. Yeah, and, and I think that's, you know, you know, 
kudos to the parents there for for trying to come up with a way to you know to have some sort of group learning to have some sort of group learning environment even if it's in a home setting and you know it sounds like you know from what she's saying that they're they're doing the right things in terms of mitigating the threat uh, of a spread and you know you know, I'll, I'll be really curious to see how how it turns out for them for for that study group as they hopefully get back into more traditional learning, and we get back to a more traditional educational environment. Uh, you know, later this school year or certainly into the the twenty one twenty two school year. Again, here's another story coming at us from Nicole. She's saying Minidoka County took a two week fall break to try and help teachers out. I don't know if that meant because they needed the time to get prepared or if they just needed the time because of illness, not sure what she's saying there. When we came back, we still had teachers out with COVID and in quarantine. So interested in what the numbers will look like mid January after the holidays. Yeah, that's the big question right now. We don't know what it's gonna look like. We don't know, you know, mid January, we know schools will be closed for, for Christmas break. We know they'll have that kind of break in the, you know, interaction of students and maybe a break in the spread from schools, regardless of whether the schools uh, stay open or go online. But who knows what mid-January is going to look like because who knows what sort of uh, spread we're going to have from, you know, families getting together for the holidays, traveling for the holidays. I mean, that, you know, that's been an emphasis uh, from the state, the concern that this is spreading to a large degree through small social gatherings, people, you know, kind of letting their guard down. I don't know how much of the spread is really, you know, we can really trace just to family gatherings, but you know, we know we'll have family gatherings. We all have people trying to get together for the holidays and where that leaves us in mid January as, as kids come back to school. I, I don't know. I don't think anybody knows for sure. Kevin, what did the Boise Board of Trustees say about spread within the school? Because they had been hearing from health professionals all along before even making this big decision to go back to remote learning after Thanksgiving, that the spread of coronavirus was not taking place in the schools themselves, that those were still safe environments, that the spread was happening in the community, and then it was obviously coming into the school. Is that still the philosophy of what healthcare professionals are thinking at this point? Really got a mixed message from the Boise School District over the past couple of weeks. You know, this whole controversy began a week ago Thursday when the school district announced that they were going to have a school board meeting. They were going to hear from hospital officials about the, uh, the district's coronavirus plan. And the district put out an announcement saying that health officials are saying that there's, you know, that the spread is not originating in the schools. And we at Idaho News heard from people right away who were skeptical, really upset about that announcement. And we were hearing from parents, we were hearing from employees alike challenging you know where where does that come from where, where are the facts here and the district had to walk it back a little bit that day and in the subsequent meetings you know you know the uh, you know the superintendent kobe dennis said last week you know there are instances where we're seeing spread originating in the schools so they really did have, have to walk that back now the hospital officials still kind of stuck with the idea that the level of spread within the schools is less uh, less severe than we're seeing in terms of community spread in the greater community, the greater Boise community. But, you know, you're, you're putting kids in an environment, you're going to have, you know, the possibility of it spread from student to student, and then as students go home, that's where you get your community spread. That will be fascinating to watch too, as we move into the colder months to see where health officials and if the tracking can even be done, if the tracing can be done to see where that spread is coming from, because that all plays into what administrators and school boards decide to do, but without the proper information, without the proper tracking, without the proper testing, it's hard to make those decisions. And I think we know from what we're hearing from the health officials that it's really difficult right now to do contact tracing, to do effective contact tracing when you have so many cases, when you have so many people that you're trying to figure out where they got it from and who they might have given it to. So it's it's hard to say with any surety how much, you know, you know, you know where you know where cases are going, where cases are where the spread is taking place when you have so many cases to try to uh, 
you know, try to do detective work about. Janet's joining us and I want to bring in her comment. It goes back to what we were talking about, Kevin, with no show students, but as a semi-retired special education teacher, I don't think you can be semi-retired, by the way, Janet. I just, you're probably all full in. That's just my own personal comment. But uh, as a semi-retired special education teacher, I have to say students with special needs are not being served. I don't know where she works, but that's what she believes. Specifically, those who need behavior intervention and those who need to build social skills. And without a doubt, I can't even begin to imagine the difficulty of students with special needs and trying to figure out what's best for them in the midst of this crazy education system we have right now. Yeah, no, I, I think we know that there are mental health issues and special needs that are not being met. Thank you for your comment there, Janet. Um, let's let's just take a little quick, we'll, we'll come back if you have more comments or thoughts or questions for us here on Making the Grade. We, we love hearing from you, really do, uh, Kevin and I both. But let's take a step away from coronavirus for a moment. And before we get to the fun last thing we always do with Kevin, which is our show and tell segment, because that's just fun. But real quickly, you guys posted a story that I think is going to have some very interesting implications in the next couple of weeks. And that is that there is going to be a run for the House Speaker in Idaho. We know that Scott Bedke has held this position for a number of years, but Representative Wendy Horman from Idaho Falls has decided to challenge Speaker Bedke for the position. Is this coming out of left field, Kevin? It caught me by surprise, I'll tell you that. Um, you know, Wendy Horman has been in the legislature now for, I wanna say about a decade. We've talked to her very, we talked to her a lot at Idaho Education News. She is a, a key member of the uh, the Joint Finance Appropriations Committee, the Budget Writing Committee. She has played a central role in education funding and education budgets. So yes, I was surprised. Um, and you know, let, let's let's talk about the civics first here because this is an in-house election. So. The House Republicans will meet, and I think they will meet virtually, uh, Horman told us on Monday. They'll meet virtually on December 2nd, and they will have a, a caucus election to pick a speaker and pick the other three floor leader positions. Uh, the, the four lawmakers who, who really kind of drive the House Republicans agenda during the session. And the speaker is the most powerful of the four. So. What Horman is doing here is she is essentially taking on a sitting speaker and in essence, she is, you know, suggesting just by making the run that she feels like she has the votes within that caucus to unseat Scott Bedke as House Speaker. And you have to remember the history a few years ago, Bedke himself unseated a sitting speaker, Lawrence Denny, who was the Speaker of the House, who's now the, uh, the Secretary of State. So. We don't see this happen very often. We do see contested speaker races before, but it's very it's not very common for a sitting incumbent speaker of the house to be voted out by by the peers, by the members of that caucus. So this is very interesting stuff. And you know, I mentioned that we talked to Wendy Horman quite a bit. I've spent hours interviewing Wendy Horman over the years. Uh, Clark Corbin, uh, my colleague who wrote this story on Monday, he has spent hours talking to Wendy Horman because she's been such a, a powerful force in education policy and in education spending over the past few years. She's she's a key source for us because she's right in the middle of the debates that we care about and cover most closely. Representative Horman has always struck me as a pretty cautious politician. She, you know, she would not be doing this, in my view anyway, uh, from talking to her for years and knowing her and covering her for years, she would not be doing this on a whim, on impulse, uh, uh, some sort of, you know, attention grabbing scheme or anything like that. I, I don't think she would be doing this unless she thought she had a legitimate shot at unseating the speaker. So this is really interesting stuff. These organizational sessions that we get right up to Thanksgiving are going to be especially interesting this year because we get the speaker race that we know about now. You'll probably have other races for leadership spots at the state house. We know we'll have a new Senate president pro tem, which is kind of the equivalent to the House Speaker just on the Senate side because uh, Senate President pro tem Brent Hill retired this year, so that's a vacancy. 
We know that the Senate Education Committee will have a new chair because uh, the chairman, Dean Mortimer from Idaho Falls, he didn't seek re-election. There are going to be new faces in powerful positions at the State House, and we'll see all of that unfold right after Thanksgiving when lawmakers get together for their organizational session. And since we're doing Making the Grade here, this isn't a political show per se, but politics plays a heavy role in education because in case you didn't realize, education takes up over half, half of the, the state budget. budget. Just K-12 takes up almost half of the state budget. And then you factor in higher ed, you're talking about 60% of your state budget goes into education. And that's just the budget end of the legislature's influence over education. The, the policy influence is so profound and so widespread. That's why we cover the legislature full time. That's why we'll be uh, watching it closely somehow, whether in person or virtually, or most likely a combination of the two. We watch the legislature extremely closely because the stakes are so high for, for public education and for higher ed. And didn't Wendy Horman, tell me if I'm wrong here, Kevin, but didn't Wendy, Representative Horman, basically get her start in if you want to call it politics, but as a school board trustee, correct? You're she right. came up through the education ranks. Yes, she is a former school board member from Bonneville, from Eastern Idaho. That's That was her first elected position. You're right. So, yeah, you know, and she's been passionate and very connected and very vocal on education issues ever since. Well, that's going to be fascinating to watch. Again, if really people lovely. want more information on that, this story is posted at idahoednews.org. You can kind of read the backstory there. And then, of course, I would highly suggest that not only you follow Kevin on social media, but all of his colleagues at Idaho Ed News who will be looking into these issues come right after Thanksgiving. Hard to believe the legislature is now just around the corner, too, Kevin, in the midst yes, of COVID-19. Yeah. <laughs> well, we want to do our final segment because it's fun. And Kevin gets a chance to do show and tell with us. And if you know anything about Kevin, he's passionate about um, great looking socks that sometimes make a statement, sometimes are just a feel good. He's also passionate about running and specifically yeah. being a long distance marathon kind of dude. But, you know, I always wonder what is your show and tell for this week, Kev? Well, I know that this is our last segment before Thanksgiving. We're not going to do a segment next week uh, as we kind of take a little bit of time off. So I could really only wear these once. Well, I wear them more than once, but it's the perfect time to wear them. Look Are they that. turkey socks? They're turkeys. They're turkeys. <laughs> so, yeah. So I don't know how we're all doing Thanksgiving. I don't know how you all are doing Thanksgiving. I know it's going to be a smaller holiday for us. I think it's going to be really the... You know, my wife and I and maybe our, our two kids will come over. It'll be a small gathering. But, you know, it's still, you know, I think we'll still have a turkey. There's still a lot to be thankful for, even in the midst of what everyone's been dealing with. So for that, I very much appreciate the turkey song. Yeah, we do need to, you know, we're hunkering down this holiday. I think a lot of people are. I think however you do it, just, you know, you know be safe for yourself and be safe for those, you know, you're meeting, you're, you're gathering with, be, be safe for your loved ones, be safe for yourself. And, you know, hopefully next Thanksgiving, we won't have to worry about all of this and we'll be able to have a little bit more of a normal holiday. Oh, wouldn't that be nice if that we look back fun. on this and go, remember, yeah. remember when you wore those turkey socks and we were, we were not meeting with anybody and we hmm. were making Cornish game hens because we only had two people in our house instead of 20. Yes. Well, here's to 2021, and but you know um, we will still you know get together with those closest to us. I, I know that's our plan. It's just going to be very small but uh, simple. Thank you for the show and tell. I always appreciate you making me smile, and thank you for all of your thoughts and your comments out there as you're watching here live on Facebook or on one of our other streaming devices at Idaho News Six. Kevin, if you want to see any of those stories, head to idahoednews.org or download the Idaho Ed News app. It is a great way to stay up to date on all things education in the state of Idaho. Appreciate the entire team over there. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving, all. Stay safe. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. <laughs>